Uh, good morning in West Coast in US and Canada and the rest of the North America and uh, good afternoon in uh, Europe or evening in uh, India all the way to Australia and Hong Kong. We are watched live on YouTube as well. Uh, we have a special uh, speaker today. Uh, it's my colleague and co-author of the book Collaborative Grand Diamond, Dushan Simic. And we have also Jason Kohn uh, as a panelist uh, uh, he, you will hear about him later. Uh, he is making a movie on Liberty Ground Diamonds with Dushan Simic. So it's very exciting that we made this uh, book after six months of hard work. Uh, and uh, it's already sold in 850 copies uh, around the world. Uh, and I'm very proud uh, to show you and to share uh, some information uh, on the book. Uh, we did uh, five webinars. This is number six. And today is about ID and tracking of Liberty Grown Diamonds with Dushan Simic. Uh, this book won't be available and possible without, uh, uh, of course, our hard research uh, during the uh, last 20 years, but also uh, without uh, good uh, colleagues and contributing authors. We have a, a scientist, Boris Fegelson, from Naval Research Laboratory, who did a nice chapter on HPST Grown Diamonds. Uh, CVD engineer Malai Hirani from India on CVD uh, grown diamonds. Sherry Woodring, uh, our colleague from New York, uh, we wrote together first uh, book in 2004, and Vidushan was second one, 2007 edition. This is a third edition. Uh, she did talk about uh, this in last webinar about uh, inclusions and update of lab grown diamonds. And Frank, Frank Ripka from Argodanza was talking about memorial diamonds. Uh, I also thank also thank uh, Antoinette Metlens, uh, author, uh, one of the best-selling authors on reviewing the book, Richard Drucker and Stuart Robertson from Guide Magazine. I think they will review the book in the magazine this month or next month. Uh, Alberto Scorani, um, the technical review, and our friends and colleagues from the trade. We couldn't do the book without seeing the uh, diamonds from the dealers, manufacturers like Anila Shesh, Tom Chatham, and others in the past, uh, like AOTC uh, and other companies. Uh, Godwin Mumtaz Gonzalez was very nice to did the design again. It was a challenge to really combine 2007 old good information with a new update around 100 new pages in this book. Uh, colleague and countryman Nesha Popovich was uh, helping us a lot with uh, collecting all your names and promoting this via webinars and newsletters. And uh, we have uh, distributors and sponsors from Australia and CJV, uh, National Castle Jewelry Valuers. Uh, you can uh, very soon, uh, we did ship a uh, few hundred books to them and they'll come any day uh, you can order better to order directly from them and from if you're in England order from please from JVA uh, Shirley Mitchell from uh, UK because it's much faster to get books from local uh, distributed than from us it takes uh, two three or four weeks to get books uh, due to this COVID situation unfortunately so this is a book outline uh, Background, we did not change. Uh, we couldn't uh, write anything better uh, because we cover history of growing diamonds by HPHT and CVD method. We cover diamond types and changing color of diamonds. What is new is new articles, 15 pages each from uh, Dr. Boris Fegelson on HPHT grow diamonds and Malai Hirani on CVD grown diamonds and Frank Ripka on memorial diamonds. We also updated chapter of producers. Taijin Lu from NGTC laboratory was nice to give us an update of uh, Chinese producers. And the biggest part of the book, as you can imagine, was identification. And in this December webinars, we're talking about only that, identification, tracking of diamonds. Uh, beside all chapters, uh, uh, Dushan did a very nice uh, chapter on, on use cross-polarized filters. You will see uh, part of it today. And uh, also, uh, we did on fluorescence and uh, inclusions in diamonds. Of course, we summarize everything for you to make it easier. We try to make it very uh, readable and easy to understand. And uh, uh, also Dushan talked today about uh, tracking of diamonds with his patent uh, and uh, fraudulent replica. And the next uh, uh, webinar, I'll talk about certification of diamonds and advanced instruments. So most of you knows uh, who I am. Uh, I will just highlight uh, three things. Uh, I was working with Dushan uh, in New York uh, for many years, we did a lot of research papers together. Uh, but last 11 years, I'm running a Canadian gem lab, uh, travel around the world, uh, teaching in 17 countries, uh, mostly this program on laboratory grown diamonds, but other programs as well on gemstones, uh, diamond treatments. And uh, some of you attended the, the conference 
Mediterranean German Jewelry Conference started in Greece 2015 with the Lebron Diamonds, and it will be next year again in Greece in Thessaloniki. Hopefully, uh, we can travel and we can come and see each other. Uh, last uh, few years, I'm doing Jumarsh Research in the Drink, uh, a lot of uh, activities, uh, instruments, uh, webinars like this, uh, online uh, education is very important. So, uh, it's really a big honor, and uh, finally, I have a chance to introduce Dushan uh, as a friend. We met in 1995 in Belgrade, uh, just a few days before uh, I took over for America to study at GIA, and Dushan came a few years after. He's one of the few jewelers who knows diamonds in, in, in Serbia, and uh, we did a lot of papers together. We travel uh, not only to the gem mines, like you can see here in Sri Lanka, but also to the conferences like Oxford, uh, Cambridge, uh, Warwick, and Dushan will uh, talk about his journeys a little bit later. And uh, I want to introduce now uh, somebody who is in uh, Los Angeles. I don't know if it's a Hollywood exactly. Jason will tell us. It's Jason Korn. It's a uh, uh, director, uh, award-winning director, actually, uh, from LA. He produced and directed the uh, movie Mandabala, or Send the Bullet, uh, who won 2007 Sundance Festival. And he is currently, uh, he also finished a, a movie, Loves Means Zero, Jason's second uh, documentary on legendary tennis coach, Nick uh, uh, Bolitieri. So uh, I will now, uh, we'll see Jason in a second. Uh, and uh, we need uh, uh, basically just to see some something from Jason, uh, from his uh, point of view, uh, not being in a trade. Uh, Jason, uh, how is going in Hollywood or LA? Uh, everything okay? I mean, I wouldn't call it Hollywood per se, but uh, Los Angeles is, is is fine. I'm originally from New York, uh, but but have lived out here for uh, for oh, about about ten years. Okay, great. So, Jason, please tell us a uh, very interesting, even for me, uh, for other people, uh, how you met Dushan, how you decided to make a movie about laboratory grown diamonds. For me, it looks like a very unique movie. Uh, I don't think anybody else made a movie for the public, for the wide audience. That will be uh, uh, working title is Origin Stories. And uh, hopefully it will be ready for some of the next festivals. Tell us more about you and your work with Dushan and how you travel around the world to the, these facilities and which interviews did you make, which one you did not make during the movie. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> so the origin of this this movie actually, I think you know a lot of people, uh, especially in the diamond world, um, were familiar with a 2003 article about um, lab-grown diamonds in Wired magazine. This was kind of a this was a big deal when it happened. Um, I remember I was I was um, in an airport heading to Brazil, making my first film when I got this uh, uh, magazine. And my partner on that film actually had uh, roots in the diamond industry. Uh, his family had been in the diamond industry. And so when I read this article, I was, you know, we were making this movie together. And I just, and the, the, the article was written in a very, um, I don't know, sensationalistic fashion. It was about Genesis and Apollo. And it really portrayed the diamond industry at a dire risk. Like, you know, uh, synthetic diamonds, lab-grown diamonds, were going to take over the industry. And, um, and, I, and I loved the story of it. I loved the idea of it. But, I, but actually, I didn't think that there was a movie at that point because the way that the article was written, it just made it sound like, okay, synthetic diamonds have come and natural diamonds are going to be dead. And, that's, and that was, you know, honestly, it was... Uh, uh, you know, I don't know about language on this thing, but it was bullshit, right? That wasn't quite the way um, what you know what was happening. Um, coincidentally, and this is the weirdest thing that ever happened. Um, I was at a, 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 a restaurant in New York and sat down at a bar next to um, somebody who had worked at Apollo. Uh, this this was back in two thousand. At this point, it was like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. And I and it was just we just struck up a conversation. He was waiting for a train, and I had always, you know, been fascinated by the story. I said, "What what happened?" And he, at this point, he said, "You know, Apollo was basically going away." You know, I don't re like. I, I wish I had gotten his information at that moment. It was so weird. It was so coincidental. It was so kind of overtaken. And he had said something about, you know. Um, that Apollo, the patents or something were being split up and it just was, it, 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 it didn't work. Um, it, at that point, like I wasn't even thinking about making a movie still. It was just a weird, that was like the catalyst for, wait, maybe there's something to follow up. And then at that, then I started to just dig in and do some more research. At that point, my first film had been done and I started looking for stories because I didn't think that there was an interesting story about just a lab grown com 
you know, coming in and destroying uh, natural diamonds, I, which was kind of the, the tenor of the, the Wired article. Anyway, my process is very slow. I wait and I wait and I just read and I, you know, I collect information. And then one day in 2013, I read an article uh, by Dushan and I had a Google alert. And, you know, so anything about synthetic diamonds was, was coming up. And this article came up um, and this was the first time I had read anything about the mixing of, of uh, lab grown or synthetic diamonds with natural diamonds. And, and I thought that that was really fascinating because it kind of, for the first time, led me to think, well, actually, maybe there's more going on in this world um, that I don't know about. I didn't know what a gemologist was. I didn't really understand the process of identification. I didn't understand anything about, other than, you know, there are natural diamonds and there are synthetic diamonds and they're both real diamonds. Um, and um, and at that time, I was also I was there was a general sense that the that the natural diamond industry was a little bit hostile towards uh, synthetic diamonds. But again, I didn't know enough to really know even know what that meant. When I met Dushan, um, who was you know, actually right before I met Dushan, I I made some other inquiries. I started asking some other people. I started looking around, um, and I also noticed that in the diamond industry. Um, nobody really wanted to talk about lab grown diamonds at this time. This is around 2012, 2013, 2014, around this time. Nobody wanted to talk about synthetic diamonds. Um, I had tried to talk to the GIA about it. They were, I would say, I don't know, KG at best. Um, it was, there, there wasn't a, a, a generosity to talk to an outsider about synthetic diamonds. And when I, I I remember like it was it was absolutely yesterday I went into uh, Dushan's office and, and at this point this is you know this is you know uh, what seven seven years ago and, and Dushan and I have spent a lot of time together and have become friends since but this is the the moment when I first went into his office and all of a sudden he was somebody as enthusiastic about his work as I was about mine and we just started talking. And Dushan was the first person inside of the diamond industry that was willing to talk to me, a complete outsider, a filmmaker, um, about a subject that I didn't know was very controversial at the time. Um, and, and that was the beginning of a very, very long relationship that ended up taking us around the world multiple times. Um, and, you know, we're now finally finishing this movie. <clears throat> but... Um, and you know, it's, it's funny that, that first conversation, I know that Duchan has something to say about, you know, Blade Runner and a little bit later, but like that was, you know, you know, as a, as a filmmaker to me, um, what was so interesting about the, 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 the character of the gemologist, um, in this world was that it did seem to me like there was a Blade Runner tie in. And if, for those of you who are listening, who might not be familiar with Blade Runner, it's a, a classic science fiction movie about a detective who has to identify the difference between human beings and replicants and replicants are basically hu almost human. And so it's about identifying the, the difference between two things that are almost identical. And, and that to me was a fascinating philosophical question. So for me, you know, it's not even so much about the business. It's not so much about, you know, the natural diamond industry, synthetic diamond industry. I really like the underlying questions about, you know, why we value the things we value uh, what are the the actual differences? Uh, what are the similarities? Uh, how how we ended up in a place where these two things were so oppositional? And it's very interesting. Uh, can you just uh, tell us uh, before uh, we, we give a microphone to Dushan, uh, who are the people that you met? And we have a lot of uh, people today in the trade, and uh, they recognize some names. Like, if you can tell us more of about course. who did you talk to and who you didn't talk. So I mean, it, listen. The, the the truth is, it took years and years and years of of, of of working on this movie before we, we ended up getting access to people. And I think, you know, by the fourth or fifth year at the Vegas Diamond Show, people started to recognize me enough to, you know, by walking around with Dushan all the time, um, that they started to see me as somebody that, that they would speak to. So we ended up interviewing, you know, Martin Rappaport, um, we, uh, Stephen Lucier. Uh, I, I did an interview with him in Botswana during site week. Um, and we filmed at the, at the mines, um, interviewed, a uh, one synthetic diamond producer who's who had a startup called Extra B named John Janik, um, a woman named Asia Raiden who had written a book about um, the diamond, or actually it was about stones uh, and, and gems in general called Stoned. Um, we interviewed 
uh, Temas Printer, the head of IGI in Bombay, um, as well as a journalist in, in, um, in Surat. Uh, we filmed in cutting and polishing factories in Surat. Um, we filmed in um, in China, in, in one in you know one of the largest, if not the largest, synthetic diamond manufacturing uh, factory in in, in China, uh, in Henan Province. So you know we really did. This was kind of a, a global story that I think represents the global nature of the diamond industry um, in general. Yeah. So you know. That's very interesting. Uh, uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, it's really interesting that you are looking forward to see the movie. Uh, it must be very uh, eye-opening for the general public who knows very little about Lebron Diamonds. If it, if you was a new uh, area, you can imagine most of the public will be completely uh, fascinating with the, your approach, a uh, little bit different than gemological. So uh, thank you again. Uh, please stay with us. And uh, maybe at the end, people will have some more questions even for you. Uh, please, uh, on the bottom of your screen, you have an uh, option uh, Q&A. Please uh, text there uh, your questions during the Dushan presentation. It will be a gemologically speaking presentation, of course. Uh, and Dushan, uh, I think the uh, microphone is yours. You are host. And approximately half an hour, 35 minutes, uh, we will, uh, all of us will ask you questions. Thank you, Branko. And um, hello, everybody. And uh, good morning, good day, good evening. Uh, welcome. I hope you will enjoy. And uh, Jason, welcome. Actually, the, our story is much wider, you know, and we did so many things and so many things are not in the movie, but uh, I think the movie will be will be great, you know, but it was a really pleasure work with you. So today I'll talk uh, about identification and tracking of laboratory grown diamonds uh, with new patent. This is uh, this is something what belongs to uh, to uh, all this story. And uh, so there are two parts. First is identification. And he, here we see something uh, um, one one lot that came to me in 2013, uh, melee stones, uh, where I found uh, using my systems, uh, where I found uh, synthetics, uh, synthetics uh, versus uh, natural diamonds, and I publish uh, this in, uh, I think, in a Rappaport. It was a, a report about this finding. And uh, when uh, we started, Branko and me, and also our colleagues with the Sherry in EGL in 2002, the situation was uh, much, much easier for us. Uh, they are doing identification because on the synthetic side, uh, so, like we didn't have a colorless, uh, colorless uh, synthetic laboratory grown diamonds. We didn't have a also in CVD, we didn't have uh, so many so so many colors except uh, except the brown that in 2003 I think so when Apollo, uh, Mr. Linares brought us one stone and this is actually our first contact with the CVD diamonds and. Of course, identification was also so easy that uh, with the with with the with the with the magnet we used to identify stone. Not only, but uh, actually, it was uh, it was beginning. You know how we start to learn also using uh, some uh, of uh, uh, advanced scientific instrument. In 2016, or from 2016, we we have already all colors except uh, treated brown and uh, and the H P T brown what uh, has no sense does not exist and uh, because of this because of this identification because here when we are talking about synthetics we don't talk only about uh, as grown stones what are dominating we are talking also about treated uh, uh, laboratory grown diamonds that could uh, create the problems during identification so identification methods that uh, has to be available except uh, this simple black box uh, identification uh, are uh, following. We are using uh, microscopy, of course, on the beginning. The second, uh, the second step will be photoluminescence imaging, uh, uh, how we call fluorescence. 
um, in a microscopy, we will check uh, we will check inclusions, also cross polarized filters. We will see internal structure of the of the uh, uh, given stones. The third step will be UVB is near infrared the spectroscopy, and on the end, this is a photoluminescence spectroscopy that. Uh, give us uh, that could give us a uh, final result anyway uh, our rule the basic rule is to make decision uh, using at least two two of those uh, methods what we are looking there are different optical centers in diamonds and uh, for example i mean there are so many for example here is uh, optical property of the diamonds uh, book of the uh, alexander zaitsev uh, famous uh, like a bible for us you know that we are also using because the number of the optical centers is uh, almost endless you know and that's how we are separating uh, uh, not only natural from synthetic, also natural from the treated also laboratory grown as grown or treated so here is a, on this slide uh, using uh, this uh, like way you know following these defects uh, it is uh, it will cover like uh, almost 90 95% of the of the of the stones they are coming to the labs for some stones they are extremely difficult then uh, we have to uh, use uh, more information that uh, are presented uh, right now here. But right now we will we will uh, I'll, I'll say something uh, what we presented in our laboratory uh, grown diamond book, you know, our concept of the third edition of the book is that the level of the gemology that we are presenting is intermediate to advanced. So it means easy to understand, easy to read. Uh, also, we have a top uh, world top uh, contributors uh, like uh, Boris, Sherry, Malai, uh, and um, also we are giving comparison from 2007 and 2020 editions where we see how even this information, what we gave, and also methods for identification from 2007 is still valuable today and can be used. Plus uh, some new, uh, uh, like uh, invention in instruments and uh, stuff like this, you know. And also we are insisting to present all aspects related to laboratory grown diamonds. Uh, it is about, uh, it is about uh, memorial diamonds. And also we are talking uh, as no one else about fraudulent replica a problem. Of course, there are a lot of pictures. Uh, the uh, all identification methods are understandable for immediate gemologists and jewelers. So cross polarized filters. Uh, it is a it is a method that uh, we are using. Uh, from the first days and uh, I like so much and uh, really, really it helps a lot. It is so good indication for the beginning. I I expect to, that all of you know how it works. There are two cross polarized filters uh, and uh, in, in cross uh, position. And uh, when we put a stone in between, simply this birefringency that belongs to the stone will give us uh, like a picture of what we don't see without cross polarized filters that could give us so much uh, information or indication of what it is. On the right side, we see generally, very generally, how it uh, looks uh, on the on on the top, it is a birefringency from natural diamonds, but it is just the one, oh, I don't know how many different birefringency, but this is one that looks, uh, the picture is really beautiful. And this pattern is due to a non-uniform impurity distribution, but we have another, another situation also. In the middle is typical, is typical by refrigerancy of uh, HPMHT grown diamond. So it means almost, uh, almost, uh, almost nothing, you know, almost like, uh, uh, like a transparent. And uh, the third one is uh, uh, 
by the free agency from uh, CVD uh, grown diamond. It is so it is so typical. And also, what I have to say, if you are trying to do by yourself, you know that when you are working, uh, then. You will see actually this uh, this effect is tridimensional and it gives you much more information that uh, for example i cannot present on the picture that we have a only two-dimensional picture but in three tridimensional uh, 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 uh watching on the stone it gives uh, much more and it is much more easier uh, to understand and also to recognize uh, some of the features that you can uh, after that you can uh, make your decision here is a range here are all the natural diamonds and here is a range of the of the situation this is a this is an endless a really endless number of the of the of of, of, of the pictures on the left side are the type 2a stone on the right side up are uh, cape diamonds uh, and then uh, like a rare diamonds uh, with the, with the natural diamonds with the, with the, with a single nitrogen and aggregated nitrogen and uh, also very rare one ab uh, one ab type of the diamonds really beautiful picture h pinch road diamonds are uh, like a sherry already uh, last uh, in in last uh, uh, webinar told us so much and uh, present us uh, beautiful pictures of the of the uh, of the inclusion that uh, that are that are uh, like a, that we see very often and this is a combination of the of the cross polarized filters actually uh, growth and, and and the structure of the diamond and and inclusion uh the boundaries between the growth sectors are very clean and it is indication that the stone is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, laboratory grown what we see in uh, in situation like this or like this or uh like this and uh, also depends on the color because here we have a g to d color and these boundaries are are very very weak but if we have a if we have a like a color uh, diamonds or the diamonds that is treated then all already these boundaries uh, became much more visible and uh, and additionally with the with the stone with a lot of uh, nitrogen like uh, here they this is a yellow stone and especially when the stone is treated to pink and then we see easily uh, all all the structure and boundaries between growth sectors CVD grown diamonds. They are so specific, you know, that that really, that really you cannot uh, you cannot miss. And I will stay uh, I will stay longer with the with the with the with the with the these uh, nine pictures where you see this is a G H uh, uh, I and J color, and uh, you see clearly this uh, difference between the center one and the, and and the eight other stones. What it is. This one in the center is as grown CVD diamonds. All others are HPMC treated. This is how it works, and it is a, it is the simplest way, simplest ways how to separate in CVD diamonds which one is as grown and which one are HPH treated. In order to 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 explain this, it will. It will take time, really, why it is going on. But one of the answers, let's make a shortcut, uh, is here. Here, we have a seeds. Seeds are like a, like, like a starting material from where uh, CBD diamonds are growing. And you see how they are looks in the in, in the bottom under 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 cross polarized filters. You know, like. Uh, you will not believe you know what it is on the top uh, they are transparent the color is like uh, i mean br brownish uh, perhaps uh, j k something like this but under cross polarized filters they look really strange 
And this is one of the problems in the growth. Actually, this, uh, this uh, all damages, let's call these damages, what we see, the black uh, black parts of, of, of the diamonds, actually they are causing, they are causing during the growth, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, again, damages in the, in the in 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 the growing in the growing diamonds of course all these damages could be removed and here is something what is a very interesting they are three three cvd diamonds similar on the beginning very similar i think one producer after hpmc treatment first one first one here it is a four hours for 1950 Celsius. Still, there there is a change. There is a change, but still, it is it it, it is a clearly this is CVD diamonds. The second one is for five hours on 1950 Celsius. Already, all this uh, uh, column or damages became much much uh, weaker, and uh, the largest picture here. This is a stone that was eight pinch tea treated for one hour on 2100 Celsius. What is very high temperature for H pinch tea treatment for so long period of time? What you see here that almost all this indication that the stone is a CVD are disappearing. And also stone started to become similar to the type 2A, type 2A natural diamond. And what is also interesting, what is not presented here, it is it is a part of some research and will be presented later. It is that uh, that uh, uh, in 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 photoluminescence uh, that uh, the band is moved to, towards the blue. There is still some some green, but the majority is in the blue. And also N3 center, 415 center is created in this diamond. So it can confuse in identification a lot. OK, that's, that's about uh, identification. And right now, I will talk about the tracking of laboratory grown diamonds. Uh, and uh, actually, it is about a patent that uh, I did, USPTO patent that I received in 2018. And uh, it was presented the first time on the World Diamond Conference in uh, Mumbai. Uh, uh, if you are interested to read about, here are all information. You can go to uspto.government patterns and to read uh, what uh, what is uh, what is idea. Okay, right now it is something what uh, Jason and we proudly did, and uh, just uh, just uh, give me give me give me a second to optimize uh, my video to make them beautiful and uh, let's see this What's this? Nexus 6, Roy Batty. Incept date 2016. Combat model, optimum self-sufficiency. Probably the leader. This is Zora. She's trained for an off-world kick murder squad. Talk about beauty and a beast. She's both.
The foreskin job is Pris, a basic pleasure model, a standard item for military clubs in the outer colonies. They were designed to copy human beings in every way except their emotions. Now there's a Nexus 6 over at the Tyrell Corporation. I want you to go put the machine on. And if the machine doesn't work? May I ask you a personal question? Sure. Have you ever retired a human by mistake? No. But in your position, that is a risk. All right, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Just relax and answer them as simply as you can. It's your birthday. Someone gives you a casket and wallet. I wouldn't accept it. Also, I'd report the person who gave it to me to the police. You've got a little boy. He shows you his butterfly collection, plus the killing jar. I take him to the doctor. One more question. You're watching a stage play. A banquet is in progress. The guests are enjoying an appetizer of raw oysters. The entree consists of boiled dog. She's a replicant, isn't she? I'm impressed. How many questions does it usually take to spot one? I don't get it, Tyrell. How many questions? 20, 30, cross-referenced. It took more than 100 for Rachel, didn't it? She doesn't know. She's beginning to suspect, I think. Suspect? How can it not know what it is? Commerce is our goal here at Tyrell. More human than human is our motto. Okay, here we are, just a second to optimize. Okay, here are questions that I used to ask uh, myself, and uh, that's why I decide to try to make something that, uh, that uh, not, will not happen that uh, someone will is trying to make uh, how they say more human than human so to, to make a synthetic diamonds they are not uh, they're not they cannot be identified you know and uh, concerns that uh, affect our industry are following that uh, right now synthetics are common products. Uh, they are being mixed with the natural. They treat us to integrity and the rarity of natural diamonds. And uh, actually, some of the some of the of the of the of the of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the tries to to solve this problem called the black boxes, uh, unable to give a hundred percent conclusive um, uh, answers. Industry responded to creating a new screening and identification services. As I said, uh, the, the companies created uh, different black boxes. They are used for the, for the mass uh, identification or screening. There is also in <laughs> very big uh, difference be between screening and identification. Black boxes, uh, Usually, in the in the 90 90 percent, they are doing just a screening, and uh, like schools, labs, organization also organizing various courses and training for diamond trade from the jewelers up to up to uh, uh, traders. Uh, what uh, what are what are problems uh, for the industry uh, if we don't have a clear and conclusive uh, conclusive evidence of a diamond uh, uh, or origin? 
uh, first, it is a difficult to 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 identify to supply chain from where where they are entering uh, they are entering uh, industry. Uh, also, there is a problem that. Uh, uh, there is no way that consumer can claim for some 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 problems when they uh, fi find that the stone is not what they bought, and uh, uh, the current process is uh, geared uh, just towards high volume and the low cost, and uh, still no one is talking except us about the problem called fraudulent replica. What is a fraudulent replica? It is uh, known for a, for a long period of time since uh, since uh, HPNHT treat, uh, treatment uh, uh, was uh, uh, was uh, uh, popular even even before 2010 you know and uh, uh, right now, it is a much bigger problem because uh, because uh, there are so many one carat plus stones uh, that uh, could be used for as a fraudulent replica. First time, public publicly, this problem was presented in Valencia in 2016 during the Mediterranean Gemological Conference. What is a fraudulent replica? How consumers and jewelers know that loose or mounted diamond uh, have been properly identified and matching certificate. Uh, based on uh, that, based on certificates and based on 4C, it is relatively easy, relatively easy to duplicate, to duplicate a stone with the same data that is on certificate. So it means to, to manufacture identical replica of certified diamonds. And uh, they can be then can be made uh, from uh, um, HPMHT treated or lab grown diamonds. Uh, then the simply the stone, the fraudulent replica will replace natural diamond and uh, before is put in the jewelry and after that no one will be interested to check uh, 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 what stone actually is in uh, in jewelry. The goals for my patent, the main goals of my patent are uh, free of cost, easy and immediate identification. Really everyone, uh, you don't need a lab, you need just a, just a UV lamp in order to uh, see uh, this pink fluorescence uh, that doesn't change uh, the color of the diamond, the diamond stay whatever was on on the beginning uh, from uh, from d up to up to uh, j color but has a pink fluorescence the second one it is a low low cost for manufacturers to produce uh, this uh, 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 fluorescence it is a really 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 cheap and fast uh, method and uh, uh, the calculation the calculation is that per cost uh, uh, creation of this uh, uh, of this defect uh, creation of the pink uh, will cost uh, uh, not less than one dollar per carat and uh, the patent also give a possibility of uh, standardizing uh, to uh, production in order to prevent uh, intentional or unintentional mixing with the uh, natural diamonds how it looks on the left side we have a we have a, a, a here are 12 uh, two pointers mounted uh, in uh, in piece of uh, in piece of metal on the left side are yellowish uh, uh, laboratory grown diamonds on the right side are natural if they are Excited with the UV lamp. UV lamp is uh, uh, above uh, the the piece of uh, metal. We will see. We will see pink fluorescence. So this pink fluorescence does not exist in natural diamonds. Natural diamonds, natural color. And uh, I mean, this is a this is a 
if you see on the colorless diamond pink fluorescence, the only what it could be, these stones are laboratory grown, nothing else. Advantages of the pantheon. This clearly and simply established the difference between the natural and the love grown. Uh, and the producers of natural and the laboratory grown diamond are sure that uh, that, uh, that, uh, that 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 the consumers will get really what they paid for. Fundamental interests of manufacturers and the laboratory grown diamonds uh, are protected. They cannot allow themselves uh, to sell something what what is not what is not what they are producing because the difference in the price is really big, and uh, simply it is a fraud. You know, if you are selling synthetic diamonds as a natural diamonds. Standardization of the patent uh, create uh, two intrinsically different products. So there is no doubts, there is no uh, problem that can can be can be can be can can uh, treat uh, to the industry. Also for the for the let's say custom agents on F uh, F. FTC guys, it is uh, giving them uh, uh, a possibility for easily monitor the the trade. And uh, on the end, knowing that uh, this difference exists and that this is easy to to see, it is uh, just uh, maintain the trust of consumers uh, for decade to come. How? What I am expecting from the from the patent? Really, right now, I think this is too early, especially for for the producers uh, to start to think uh, uh, about this and accept my idea. They have enough; they own problems, you know, with the production, uh, with the with the patent rights, uh, and uh, still. Everything is uh, on the beginning, you know. Who is uh, already supporting my idea and has understanding are international organization related to natural diamond uh, uh, trade. They see uh, this patent as uh, like easiest, simplest, the cheapest way to different uh, to make a difference between natural and laboratory grown diamonds. Where I see the the largest the largest chance that uh, people will start to talk uh, and that uh, this question will come to FTC, for example, are uh, like uh, like companies like this that I found on the on the on the on on, on the internet. Uh, this is a uh, this is a big platform. They are selling uh, uh, natural diamonds, jewelry, gemstones. Uh, uh, laboratory grown diamonds also and I see that, that the company like this will recognize uh, like my patent as the easiest way you know for them to separate all their products like uh, who is thinking of what is what between the gemstones uh, or natural diamonds this is this is a known they are two different uh, products uh, easy to recognize it has to be same with the natural and the laboratory grown diamonds. And uh, I mean, that's that's what I wanted to say to today. And uh, you are welcome. You are welcome to, to ask uh, all of us, you know, I hope you have a question. And uh, thank you for your time. Uh, it's me. Uh... Yes, thank you, Dusha, for telling me. So I will start to read questions uh, uh, from the beginning, uh, from easier to more uh, complicated. The first one uh, is from John uh, Chapman, uh, who is uh, editor of a Metrian German Jewelry Conference. Uh, 
a question for uh, I think the best Jason. Uh, what is the name of the movie or Dushan? Uh, and is it documentary or some thriller? I think after Blade Runner, uh, people asking this question, uh, what kind of movie it is? Uh, so I'll answer that question. It is a documentary. Um, and, but if you've seen any of my films before, uh, it's not a typical documentary. It's, um, it should feel a lot more like a, um, a regular movie. Um, and the, all the details, the title, um, when it's going to be released, all that stuff is being figured out right now because we're, we're still finishing the film. So hopefully within the next, you know, three months, maybe beginning of new, new, new year, we will have a proper announcement that, you know, hopefully everybody in the jewelry industry will, uh, will, will be able to get in, uh, access to, but, um, yes, that's, that's, that's that for now. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jason. Um, I have one easy question that uh, I will answer, uh, from, uh, Michael Schlamander from Swarovski, who is our supporter uh, and one of the sponsors of the Metrayan German Jewelry Conferences, uh, when to be the next uh, dates of the next conference. And uh, right now, Michael, uh, we booked, uh, rebooked a uh, hotel from this May to second weekend of July. Uh, same hotel, uh, five stars in Thessaloniki. So we do hope uh, uh, restrictions for traveling will be. E easier in the spring and we will all be able to meet each other and uh, do a conference that will be also feature Liberty Grand Diamonds in the workshops. So this is good news. Uh, I'll update everybody uh, probably in February, March, uh, once we have more information and um, more measures are, are in place. Uh, so this is a question about that. Uh, now I can uh, basically uh, ask questions from uh, gemologically speaking uh, for Dushan. Uh, uh, there is a question from Sherry. Have you ever seen an HPHT grown diamond, a synthetic diamond with a pattern in cross polarized filters similar to CVD? Uh, no. Theoretically, it is, a, it is a possible. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see actually after uh, when I used to talk about uh, this uh, experimental stone in order in order to continue process HPNT process uh, it will go towards uh, towards uh, 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 pattern that is similar to to HPNT grow. Mm -hmm. It 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 is uh, it. Uh, it cannot create a problem for identification because uh, this uh, process is very expensive, takes takes uh, too long, but theoretically it is uh, possible. And uh, just uh, just uh, just uh, we will see. You know, it yeah. is one of the, of the threat for the identification anyway uh, in the future. Uh, thank you. And I have a, uh, one question uh, prepared uh, before uh, for me. Uh, as a big user uh, of cross porous filters and teaching the workshops and uh, having a lot of samples, uh, I really uh, like uh, the chapter uh, on uh, cross porous filters. It's 15 pages. So we talk about this picture here. We have uh, uh, basically nine stones, and in the center, one is the one with the pattern that is parallel to the table. Uh, this is uh, great that you are uh, you are telling that uh, this is uh, enough proof for you that this is a stone not treated. The question is uh really uh how is it really uh 100 proof and what's the experience and can people use this uh, uh, technique as saying this is a not treated uh cvd versus treated and uh, do you think it's important for the trade to know this uh from point of value from point of disclosure yes Yes, of course. The, this is the fastest way. But again, as I said earlier, in order to make uh, to make a final decision, you need to use uh, two two methods. If I say that for me it is enough to see because uh, you know that we are working that we are using this method uh, method for almost twenty years, you know, and uh, I saw I don't know how many stones, you know, it is uh, it is uh, it is easy. But but again. Uh, but again, uh, especially with the gemologists, they are working in the labs. They have a daily hundreds of stones. You know, they can they can train themselves and uh, find a way to 
to to be really sure, hundred percent sure when they see one pattern in three D in, in in three dimension that, that they can freely make a decision. You know. Yeah, because uh, I also see in laboratory here uh, in Canada uh, a lot of stones from Diamond Fund, other producers, and seems to me uh, trade. Uh, start to care about this if stone is uh, enhanced, post-treated or not. And this is a question to uh, one more question in this direction. Uh, this is very important. Uh, uh, question is uh, uh, is uh, like this. Uh, do the growth feature found in CVD have any effect on the character, talking about brilliance, dispersion of the stone? Does the HPHT process post treatment a little bit influence or eliminate these features, like influence the uh, brilliance dispersion of the stone? If you, basically they're saying if it's better or, or less brilliant, or I don't know if you studied this, Dushan, but I know you're doing uh, some interesting project on on CVD uh, stability uh, uh, right now, and I, I don't know how much you can disclose because the preliminary stage. Uh, you, we talked about this with Sherry Woodring in a previous webinar. Somebody asked a question about stability of CVD. It's not the same question, but what you can say about effects of HPHT process and uh, generally stability of CVD diamonds when they're treated or not treated, just what you can tell. But the HPHT process can only improve uh, CVD. I mean, first it depends uh, depends on the seed. The seed is uh, crucial. If you have a if you have a CBD seed that is uh, cheap, you know, then uh, you see how it looks, and the growth uh, will be affected by by damages uh, in the seed. And uh, this uh, this columnar uh, columnar pattern also affecting uh, affecting uh, uh, optical properties of the diamonds. That in some CVD really when uh, when uh, when we are talking about dispersion that simply we don't see that light is dispersed. We don't see the fire because really all these structural damages inside enable dispersion of the light. So how could be eliminated? Of course, with the H pinch T, because uh, if you are, this is combination of the H pinch T of the CVD grown and the, like a H pinch T grown post mm -hmm. post treatment, and uh, as we know, H pinch T grown diamonds uh, they they really behave the light uh, uh, light behave in H pinch T grown diamonds. Identical as in a natural diamond, so so, so it means to put CVD stone in uh, in uh, in condition in the un, un, under the pressure and and temperature when uh, the diamond uh, uh, became stable, simply will create uh, these CVD diamonds more as a H pinch C diamonds. Depends on the time that. Uh, Diamonds spend uh, under pressure and uh, and temperature. Yes, uh, what is not easy, and this yes. is not cheap, but uh, yeah. it, it goes towards uh, this, you know. So, uh, generally, just to summarize, I hope I, I summarize correct. Uh, also, for us gemologists uh, and uh, appraisers, what you're saying in your presentation and in the book, and now I think, the more CVD is post treated with a higher temperature, the more pattern and properties would look like a natural diamonds type 2A. So this is a part of limitation of the this one technique and to use other technique. And uh, this is the this is the question for you from me. Uh, uh, I know we are both very big uh, promoter of using two, three different techniques. Uh, what do you think uh, uh, is coming uh, up in the next five years? What do you recommend as a, as a techniques right now? And what do you see? Uh, in the future, uh, because you also visited many factories in China, India, US. Uh, what is your prediction of what's the best techniques to use now and in next couple of years with, with the production, making better quality, bigger diamonds? As they announced uh, lately, they make 12 carat now CVD certified in Hong Kong from China. So this is the direction that's going, yeah? Yeah, as you know, I'm not a fan of uh, black boxes. I think. Uh, of course, could help. It is indication, but after that, if you ask me what I'm using, they are this is a UV like a deep UV uh, deep UV uh, uh, absorption, 
the from uh, 2040 up to up to uh, 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 tau, uh, 1050 nan nanometers that give me the the whole uh, the whole absorption and the four or five induced photoluminescence. Mm -hmm. For now, this is enough for me. And all these methods are giving results, graphs, in two or three seconds. You know, this is really fast. And this is what I promoted, even what I, what I promoted and uh, announced in 2013 when I started uh, 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 this service. Still, uh, right now, I, I stay with this idea and also right now i am trying with uh, one company from europe to make uh, this uh, portable instrument uh, that will be enough fast and that, that uh, will uh, give uh, you opportunity not to screen to identify not only um, uh, loose also mounted uh, diamonds and uh, of course, for some stones, you will need a Rennie show. Rennie show costs 200 plus thousand dollars. Yes. In the most complicated cases, because we don't talk only about synthetic. We are talking only about the natural treated. You have, we must take care about the, the whole specter of the stones, you know. Yeah, uh, that's correct. And this is a same direction question uh, by uh, anonymous. Uh, uh, we had this uh, question before, but uh, it's uh, coming again. Uh, have you tested ARI by Presidium, which is created to test coralless diamonds? Uh, I have it here uh, due to webinars. I didn't have a chance to uh, test it on 55 samples uh, I use for other uh, six, seven instruments. Uh, I will do it before my next webinar on December 18. I think, Dushan, you didn't see this instrument yet uh, because it's black box instrument. It's basically. Uh, have you heard about Ari? Probably not. Yeah, Ari is from Presidium. It's the latest one. Uh, um, anyway, we used to shoot. We used to shoot in Presidium in yeah, yeah. Singapore. Jason and me at the time. They, they, they it, it was it, it was under development and, and production. Yes, something yes. Uh, something like this. But yes, you correct. know that I'm not. Uh, yeah, but, uh, I tested quickly and uh, definitely. It's better than not having uh, the instrument, for sure. It's a good instrument to screen. But again, you cannot separate type 2 natural diamonds from uh, from a two-way CVD HPHT by one instrument like Ari. Or so uh, this is my first uh, uh, first uh, uh, reply on that. But again, uh, on on December 18, uh, I will talk about this uh, uh, in detail. And because by that time, I'll, I will test it on 55 samples, and uh, uh, and to be more uh, accurate. So, uh, question. Uh, this interesting question, actually, <laughs> uh, from Antonet Metlins: uh, Are all static diamonds still type two A? Uh, because mm -hmm. uh, answer is we know the answer. Uh, maybe she meant coralless. Uh, he says most coralless diamonds type one, but we know that uh, whenever it's come yellowish diamonds or yellow, they're type one B. But also, Dushan, you can mention about the stone. We, uh, uh, we put in a book uh, about combination of, of types and uh, uh, maybe a little bit more about other uh, possibilities. Uh, with the high temperature uh, growing diamonds, they can be uh, not only uh, type 2A, it could be uh, creating uh, some of the type 1 diamond, correct? Yes, of course. Depends uh, depends on the um, um, amount of, of the nitrogen that uh, that is uh, uh, that the growers allowed to enter uh, the diamond during the the growth. Um, after that, uh, uh, this uh, single nitrogen can be aggregated, and uh, it is starting from uh, uh, type one uh, AA up to up to I mean up to uh, Cape Stone. It is a it, it it could be done, you know, and uh, uh, creation of the optical centers characteristic for for natural diamond uh, it is possible to create. But again, it is a it is a matter of the time and matter of the money that has to be uh, invested uh, for commercial. I don't think that something uh, like this will be happen. But for example, it could be with someone who has ability to do this, you know, uh, 
they can do this from time to time just to just to check uh, laboratories <laughs> are they are they so uh, picky you know are yeah. they really, Precisely, really checking the stone or just a screening a stone yes yes it, right. could be, it could be a problem because it's we a, know already how many mistakes the labs did in the in the past you know of course the yeah. the, the, the mistakes are part of uh, of the of the of the work and the of course, could happen. Yeah, Edushan did not talk about type of diamonds too much because uh, he wanted to have more uh, discussion with you. But basically, it's covered in the book about diamond types. Uh, in our all three editions, we talk about this for, for 15, 20 years. Uh, type 2 without nitrogen, type 1 with nitrogen for those who doesn't know or are new in the trade. Uh, uh, in this direction, uh, another question about fluorescence from Antoinette. Do, does uh, any diamonds laboratory grown exhibits blue fluorescence. Uh, is it still safe to say that if it's blue is natural and especially uh, I would uh, talk about strong, uh, she was she mentioned stronger reaction on the long, long UV. We still use this, uh, what I know as a, if it's stronger and the blue is stronger, we use it as a, uh, we put in the book, a strong, strong proof that diamond is natural. But as we know, many diamonds, especially CVD, do not fluoresce or has same intensity on the long giving short UV. So Dushan, what you can say about this fluorescence as a, uh, I can say, screening tool? I know it's not 100%, it's changing, but what is still valid, what do we have to be pay attention for fluorescence? First of all, I have to say that uh, every diamond show fluorescence, really every. So you will say, how, if, if I don't, don't see, but uh, if you are measuring this with the instruments, they are able to recognize. You will see, you will see uh, this fluorescence on the much uh, lower intensity. And uh, and of course, you know, you can you can create. A, the, the, there is also combination not only on HPHT uh, 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 annealing. It it could be added to to to, to this irradiation. That, uh, that that will create possibility to create much more much more natural f features to enter a vacancy that that uh, that, uh, that will give us uh, h3 h4 center uh, entry center and really it could confuse uh, it can confuse uh, 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 people during identification but uh, uh, it is much easier with the with the HPHT with the HPHT uh, grown diamonds because of the of the catalyst that uh, we see in uh, spectroscopy, with the with the CVD in order that the silicon is present. Then uh, really, really, it is uh, it is uh, it is uh, simple to uh, to to recognize and say this is this is. Uh, this is uh, 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 synthetic diamond and also NV centers are a good indication. But for all of this, you really yeah. need to have a, you have to do spectroscopy, not only uh, photoluminescence imaging yes. or PL imaging, uh, what uh, actually uh, 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 Antoinette is uh, asking. Yes. Uh, in next webinar, I'll talk more about fluorescence, but for me, it was a uh, a learning uh, from people who are asking questions as well. What we say blue is not always blue. It could be greenish blue, green blue, bluish green. So very important to make uh, images of fluorescence and communicate. And that's why I like uh, uh, instruments like PL Inspector or Jewel Inspector. We can use program and make images and communicate. I'm not saying it's the best because you, the best to see stone uh, uh, in, uh, by yourself and then decide and test. But at least this blue is really a lot of shades of blue. Like uh, when stone is HPHT treated CVD, become a little bit greenish blue, bluish green, because a little bit creation of entry center after treatment, given this bluish tint. So very big, very, very careful with fluorescence, uh, what is the color and how to, so it's always good to use charts and communicate uh, on the same level. So my, my also, little feedback. Branko, I would say for our fourth edition, uh, our fourth <laughs> edition will be more uh, like advanced towards uh, scientific uh, gemology where we will present uh, actually uh, what is fluorescence how this fluorescence is moving in visible in uh, in visible spectra you know after treatment how is on the beginning after grow du during the treatment how is moving yes. towards uh, to 400 nanometers to blue to blue area 
this is something what the generally has to be understand and the, that the the yeah uh, this book is more on intermediate level a little bit touching advanced uh, uh, with a few articles but we want to just uh, to give you a good a solid uh, base to jump another level for next year so this is an interesting question from actually our uh, ex Yugoslavia from Slovenian uh, jeweler in in in, uh, Aust in Australia Peter uh, Peter uh, recently, I came across a couple of lab grown diamonds identify this based on inscription of the girdle. That's that's a good first step, of course. My question is, what is the percentage of lab grown diamonds in smalls and bigger stones? And also, how big would be the percentage of bigger lab grown diamonds without inscription? Uh, Dushan, you can try to answer, but uh, I'm seeing more uh, stones uh, inscribed and not inscribed. But you can tell something first and I can maybe add to it. But I have my um, view on this. Uh, I think you would uh, you, you you would give a, a better yes. answer than, yes. than than me. You are a lab, uh, yes. so inscription uh, means uh, yes means nothing. So, that's uh, that's I would say again. That's why I that's why I try to to find the solution. Okay, uh, talking about inscription, uh, uh, fluorescence, you know, not to scare too much the public if they're listening, but. Uh, we know in 2000, 2001, it was a lot of stones for HPHT enhanced, treated type 2A, 2 carats, 3 carats, 4 carats, big stones. And they should be laser inscribed uh, by major labs, and they are when they detect the HPHT enhanced. But what happened when they come to second user or dealer or could happen very easy that that laser inscription is just removed without losing even one point of, of the weight so it's I've seen it uh, stones without inscription, so it doesn't match uh, GA report or other labs. So it's this treated. So it could happen the same in lab grown diamonds. So it's possible to remove this. Uh, all stones that come to my laboratory, uh, we need to describe lab grown uh, when we identify them. I get a uh, few hundred stones every week uh, uh, from local uh, retailer and uh, uh, people in Canada. Uh, and I'm a relatively small laboratory. Uh, I'm, I'm big in Canada, but small compared to uh, world standards. So uh, what's happened is that I've seen stones, uh, half carat, one carat, they're not laser inscribed. They're, they're buying them uh, in a parcel, especially half carat or, or quarter of carat. So we laser inscribe them. So what happened is some of them definitely on the market without inscription. And uh, what you will do when you see inscription DF, what does it mean to you, Dushan, or anybody? DF and number. Does it mean too much? DF. But uh, I can tell you, means uh, diamond foundry uh, because they do their own inscription. But so you have to be very careful what these numbers are, what these letters are, and of course uh, the only best way uh, for Peter, uh, for you and other people is to to test it, uh, to do your own test, uh, to buy simple instruments uh, uh, from me or from other people uh, in Australia, or uh, and to to do some some work on identification. That's why I'm very glad uh, you bought the book and other people. This is the first step to see what you can do with the standard instruments and which case you need to send it. So definitely uh, most bigger diamonds should be laser inscribed and they are. Uh, but the question is, uh, if somebody wants to cheat and, and sell stone, they can easily remove it. This is the answer. <laughs> but, about also, this. but also, Peter, uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure that all fraudulent replica stones are inscribed as a, as a natural diamonds. Yes, yes. And I mean, so uh, what Dushan is saying, uh, Peter, is that you can have a, a stone with inscription of GAA. Of course, the GA letter won't match GAA original letters, but to be very, very close. So if you're not really uh, seeing many of the GA uh, less inscribed diamonds, you can say, oh, look at this. This is the 2.15 DVS2 uh, diamond, it has GA inscription, has a report, and you say, oh, this is uh, great. And But it takes just five minutes to put on the uv light and put check on the cross polarized filters to really see is something uh, problematic with the stone and you can with these two tests you can don't do 100 percent but you can do 80 90 percent of of your screening uh, and go further so and of course because it's clean stone you cannot see you can match inclusion vvs2 stones so you have to do fluorescence and uh, even weight will be the same measurements will be uh, very uh, the same so this is a problem with this fraudulent replica uh, uh, copying the uh, reports. 
Yeah, so, because it is a, it is a, um, when we are talking about cross polarized filters, uh, it is also do, do, doable when, uh, and, uh, and, and these features are visible when the stone is mounted. Because uh, all big stones, actually, the most, like 90% or, or, or something like this, uh, are CVD. And this pattern is so obvious in the most of the stones. And really, just in seconds, uh, you will check if the, stones, if, if the stone is natural or CVD grown. This is uh, relatively okay, uh, easy, really. We have a few more questions, and then uh, we'll close uh, in five minutes. So if you have any uh, last thoughts, please uh, text it now, because we, we don't want to make it too long uh, for those who want to listen uh, recorded the webinars. The many of them ask me afterwards to listen on YouTube or on our website. So this is uh, uh, from Alessandro Amato, who also got our book uh, from Europe. Hi, is there color of CV diamond stable? <laughs> Question that you touch it, but uh, I think you will not answer in two, three months or maybe earlier, but you can tell something what you think now uh, without disclosing too many details, but because on purpose, you didn't want to show some of the results now because we want to wait for next uh, webinars, but maybe or yeah, it has to be. It has to be. Um, uh, right now, it is in process. Uh, uh, is uh, one uh, one uh, uh, project where, I mean, when you are talk with the producers, you know, it is it is not a question, you know, that uh, that uh, under the 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 temperature. Even the temperature should not be 1,000, 500, 600 uh, during the polishing or just uh, heating the, the, the metal when, ju when jewelers are working, that the color will be, will be changed. And this is not only about instability of, the, of, the, of, of, of this uh, structure of the CVD diamond. It is also about uh, possible when the Right now, I'm going to approve that uh, uh, diamonds are CVD diamonds only. We are talking only about CVD diamonds because of, uh, of these uh, uh, structural damages uh, that could be, could be doped with the with with different with the, with the, with the, with the, with the mate material from the uh, uh, polishing wheel uh, with the oil that could affect, after some period of time, uh, color during the oxidation and simply depends on the quality the lower quality uh, lower color uh, is more unstable than the higher color that's like a general answer to your question yeah uh, we're working on this and Dushan is more active but i will support it uh, in the future uh, with some upcoming article or webinars. We're already planning webinar for 2021. So anyway, Dushan, a uh, lot of people uh, text that you did a wonderful job and they like it. Uh, our friends, Sherry, uh, of course, uh, Woodring and uh, Nilesh and Antoinette, they're even asking you why you're not coming again as a speaker at the Mediterranean German Jewelry Conference. So we have to consider you now for next year or year after. Uh, Greece is very close to Serbia, so you can swing uh, home and uh, uh, see your family and go to Greece maybe and talk about this topic, especially if you do some research on, on CVD stability. This is uh, something very new. Uh, last question, uh, actually comment, I think is very positive for you. Uh, it's mean you did a good job with the presentation. Uh, Gina Barreto from New Zealand and their uh, uh, organization, uh, the part of New Zealand Geological Association, they're just ordering books from us uh, recently. So Dushan, where and when can we buy your product? She means patent. I think it's not possible to buy it, but hopefully. No, 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 no. <laughs> it, 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 it has a sense. It, it has a sense, really, Gina, because uh, uh, actually, uh, how came to this when one big company, uh, one of the largest, you know, when they started with the, the, their line of uh, 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 jewelry with the, with the laboratory grown diamonds? They uh, uh, send me the whole line and uh, just um, ask me, like, uh, we are suspicious that we have a natural stone mixed with the, with the, with the, with the laboratory ground. What happened during the setting? The setter just uh, didn't know what he's uh, se setting uh, uh, inside. Of course, I found the natural stone between, uh, between, uh, between uh, uh, 
lab, uh, 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 lab grown. And then I start to think, oh, how to, to make this uh, like easy uh, for producer to give and came to this pink fluorescence. Okay. Just uh, if you excite, all are, all have a pink fluorescence, that's okay. All are laboratory grown. And I started with this idea. I wanted to sell this, uh, this method and patent to this company. Well, they didn't decide, but then came someone else, one uh, smaller guy who has uh, their own production, and he is interested just to, 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 like, uh, uh, to sign their stones with a pink fluorescent. He will say, okay, my stones, they have a pink fluorescence. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. to make them different than others, you know? Yeah, for me, fluorescence is a so, great feature, uh, uh, not negative. I mean, many dealers talk about negative fluorescence influence on color, but fluorescence is quite uh, positive for identification points from point of... Uh, when I show people uh, fluorescence, I, I've seen, I did this uh, on this uh, Halloween uh, picture, remember fluorescence of this... Uh, uh, item like uh, uh, skull, people love it. Fluorescence to see it's it's fun for them to see fluorescence. So it uh, could be positively uh, uh, presented, not only negatively. So it's all about yeah, marketing. You and, don't uh, see you don't see pink. Uh, this is a yeah. G or 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 that. You you you, yeah. you see this color. It, it, it is it is we are using this just to be sure that uh, yeah. what we see is a uh, uh, lab grown diamond. And uh, like us, I think Antoinette uh, loves fluorescence and she thinks uh, one of these uh, topics will be great for uh, for next upcoming conference. We don't know uh, how it will be, Antoinette, uh, it's another not comment of, in spring, but things could change and uh, we, 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 we want to be positive and think that we next summer uh, we can see each other uh, and do uh, another conference and maybe do will come or somebody else. Uh, we already have a, a whole program on gemconference.com. Uh, in February, March, I will double check with speakers who is available, who wants to come and workshops. So far, uh, we are just on standby mode. So Dushan, after this lecture, I think you'll be more known uh, with wider circle, uh, not only technical and uh, research, more like a gemology circle. And after a movie with Jason Cohn, I think public, uh, you'll be maybe most famous gemologist if, if, if move, movie is very, very successful. So I want to thank uh, Jason uh, uh, for coming and with us so early. Uh, seven to eight in the morning uh, in LA and Vancouver. I want to thank Dushan uh, for this uh, great presentation and all of you who came. I know many of you listen on the YouTube also, and we will uh, put this uh, little bit edit a uh, few minutes in the beginning and uh, put it uh, on YouTube uh, uh, very soon. Uh, it's already there, but we'll edit a little bit. And uh, you can share with your friends uh, who didn't come, uh, your uh, client base, your association, it's a free education for me, Dushan. We love what we're doing. When I get a phone call from New Zealand, like yesterday, uh, the people are happy to receive our book. And now they're coming very early to listen. This is the best uh, thank you for me and Dushan for doing this. Uh, we're not getting rich of this. Uh, uh, we just want uh, to give our knowledge uh, when we still can. We're still in good years <laughs> to, to share our knowledge. And hopefully, uh, Jason, you would agree with that. And uh, please uh, make this movie uh, not in uh, next, uh, make it before June, so at least all of we know about us, so we can in summer have a lot of people come to our conferences and and uh, meetings. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying my hardest. Thank okay. you guys so much for having me, and good luck. And yes, uh, Dushan, I'll see you later. Stay. And, yes, uh, yeah. Thank yeah, you guys. Stay. Take care. Touch, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, Everybody. And uh, any questions you can email to Dushan uh, Schwab NYC at uh, yahoo.com or myself info at branco dot uh, info at branco gems dot com. And uh, we'll see you in December 18, the last webinar before Christmas uh, with me. Dushan will be the, the moderator and uh, we will uh, talk about uh, identification and certification, anything basically that you would like to ask uh, to be last webinar. Okay, all the best.